Now, hi everybody, welcome to Stretch for Lounge. I'm your host, Bill Whittle, with show number 178 of the ongoing saga of uh, desperation, madness, and despair. Uh, how's everybody doing? I hope everybody's well. I uh, was in Las Vegas with my beautiful bride last uh, last week, had a really great time, and been on the road, I think, the week before that, too. Yeah, so here we are back again. Um, I hope everybody's doing well, and... Uh, I'm trying to think what the uh, big update would be for now, and I just sure can't think of anything, to be perfectly honest with you. I have a feeling I'm going to try and move mail real quickly this week. Oh, I remember there's something I could chat about. Um, um, there's uh, a person I'd like to get involved with uh, professionally in terms of um, getting some of the message spread. Um, reason I need to keep the show short tonight is I need to call him after uh, the show's over and he's on the East Coast. Um, but they linked uh, my guns video, which is about five years old, on a Facebook uh, page. And uh, in, I think in six days, it did 33 million views, which is my entire career, basically. You know, I think it's probably 40 million career views over my life, something like that. And... Um, and then to have one go to 33 million in, in six days is uh, really what I needed, to be honest with you, more than anything. This, um, Fonzo Rachel pointed this out first. This suppression, you know, that they're doing, oh, just so you can see the shirt, by the way. There you go. Uh, this suppression of, of um, views by Facebook and YouTube <clears throat> really is... Uh, an effective uh, way to de demotivate people like me because, um, you know, you were doing, uh, routinely doing, you know, a million views or at least in the high hundreds of thousands, and then it goes to the low hundreds of thousands, and then very quickly um, it, uh, it, it goes to like, you know, 20 or 30,000. I mean, I've got a I've got, uh, do I have 100,000? I guess it's 100,000 uh, Facebook, sorry, YouTube subscribers. And um, and I'll post a video, gets seen by 16,000 people. Yeah, and it's just over weeks. And it's just heartbreaking. And it really does work. It, not only does it work to prevent the message from getting out, but it's just a very hard uh, thing to bear because, you know, this is, Basically, the reason you do the work is to get it seen by people. And the reason the members have been members through thick and thin um, is to get the message out. So it's it's uh, very uh, alarming. But uh, the person who did the actual um, boosting of this thing is one of those f just Facebook geniuses, uh, social media geniuses, and a really good guy. Uh, who's been been real quick uh, to defend me and so on and so in any event I was um, I was pleased to see that so we we'll see if we can put together some kind of an arrangement where we can continue to do something like those kind of numbers because those are those that's just a shot of vitamins that I needed real badly to be honest with you um, yeah 33 million views may be higher now that's my highest ever single that I was aware of biggest number I ever saw in one place was uh two and a half million so you know ten times my best uh, previous thing and and so I was very very pleased about that uh so in any event we're gonna uh we're gonna continue to do that and um since guys a social media guy I'd like to get a hot topic for the week and go ahead and do that but uh, anyway I keep talking about all this other stuff and um We'll see, but I certainly needed it, so that was good. So I do have to move pretty quickly uh, today, uh, and um, so we're going to, I don't have a whole lot of other updates to give you, to be perfectly honest with you, nothing comes to mind anyway. So why don't we just leap right into the questions, uh, and here we go. Uh, top question is from uh, Daryl Green, and he writes, what do you think about Trump embracing restriction on our Second Amendment rights? Many FUDs think this is solely about blame about banning bump stocks, but it's not. The wording proposed can be interpreted to ban so much more. I, you know, Daryl, 
not a whole lot of times this happens, but this is one of those times I just don't know anything about what he said. Um, I mean, I can give you my my gut reaction on it. Um, you know, do not infringe means, you know, shall not be infringed upon means shall not be infringed upon. But if you're going to if you're going to ban automatic weapons, which are banned, I don't, they're certainly banned in California. I'm, I just plain also don't know whether a fully auto uh, AR-15 or something like that is legal anywhere. I just don't know the answer to that. But, um, you know, the bump stock is essentially, it's a, it's a poor man's automatic weapon uh, conversion. The thing that's most striking to me about all of this that you hear from the progressives, and we're not going to get too deep into this unless I get another question on it. We've made this argument 100,000 times. I just made it earlier today with this clown who, um, you know, had the nice, uh, had the, the, the decency to come and say, I hope you or somebody you love dies in a mass shooting. You know, I, I know there are people out there with different of opinion, different opinions than me about this, and I think they're really, really wrong, but I'm quite sure that I've never wished that on anybody. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want really evil people to like Michael Moore and, and I don't want anybody to die in them. I don't want anybody to die because I disagree with them. But that's the um, that's the, the uh, tolerant and progressive left that we've come to know and love. So um, let me just say this. The, the thing that's so frustrating about um, the whole argument is when you hear these people saying, well, geez, you know, we ought to make it harder for crazy people and felons to get guns and, and, and all of these laws that we need to have. And time and time and time and time again, you just have to explain to people, these laws are already on the books, you know? I mean, they're, they're already there. And I guess it's just not dawning on people that people who are willing to go in and commit mass murder are also willing, apparently, to violate gun laws. Does that thought not draw any water with people? Does it just... I keep coming back to this. It's it's like, well, we're going to make a law to make it harder to, to murder people when my point is, look, if you're ready to murder somebody, it's pretty much the top dog, right? I mean, murder is your, your, murder's your, your, your ace... Uh, you know, so it's, it's it's the four aces of crime. Premeditated mass murder is about as about as far out on a moral limb as you can go, and I simply don't understand the mentality that says that we're going to pass a law that's going to make it easier to accomplish this act when you're determined to accomplish this act in the first place. As I said before, it's like it's just like assuming that somebody's going to be deterred by a you know, this is a restricted parking zone, or you can't park there. That's a handicap spot. Don't you realize that's against the law? Well, yeah, I do, actually. But since I'm going to go into the school and gun down everybody I can find, I don't think I'm really too worried about that. Um, again and again and again, it needs to be said, the reason so many people have such a knee-jerk reaction about this is they want something to be done, and they want something to be done that is something that can be just legislated, like Ta-da! If only we could get these Republicans to pass reasonable gun control legislation. Well, there's already reasonable gun control reg legislation. And before there was reasonable gun control le legislation, there were no mass shootings. I'm sorry that it's inconvenient for your philosophy, but that's true and everybody knows it's true. There was no restrictions on gun ownership for the huge portion of this country's history. And I'm not saying that the restriction on gun ownerships caused the... Um, the mass shootings, what causes the mass shootings is twofold. It's it's first and foremost, not my opinion, Park Dietz, forensic psychologist who studies these things, made it crystal clear that if you want to stop these mass shootings, then you need to stop mentioning names and showing pictures and doing body counts. The, the, this guy in Florida had the most chilling thing ever. He said he was reading about a previous mass shooting and he said, quote, I can do so much better. It's a contest for it's a contest for people who've not been allowed to compete in in baseball. So so the whole oh we need to restrict more guns and therefore get rid of the the mass shootings things is is it's obviously wrong on its face. There were no restrictions at all before. As I said, walk into a hardware store with whatever money you have and you carry out as many as many guns as you want to. We never saw this kind of thing. 
So it's 24-7 news coverage of these people. It gives them incentive to go out in a blaze of glory and body counts, just like this kid. By the way, whose name I know and will not mention, you'll never hear me mention the name of any of these other people either. And more to the point, it's the, it's the progressive destruction of the moral fiber of this country. Now, let me be clear by, by what I mean about that. I'm not saying that these lunatics wouldn't have been lunatics in, in an earlier time because murderers have been here forever and so have crazy people. But what I'm talking about when I say you destroy the moral fabric of the country and you get more and more of these is you get more and more people on the margins. So you're now you're just dealing with a percentage game, a numbers game. But more importantly than that, you don't have any of the preventative mechanisms that used to exist in this country, let's say, 50 years ago. In other words, if you're going to destroy families, if you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to take fathers out of the family, for whatever well-intentioned purposes you might have about aid to single mothers and so on, but the fact is, marriages and families are falling apart. The number of single uh, parent homes are highest uh, than they've ever been, and everybody knows it's a prime direct correlation of, you know, between violent criminals and fatherless boys and all the rest of it. But even deeper than that, it's like who, who would have caught this guy if this had happened when I was a kid, let's say in 1973? I mean, let's just say this guy was in school in 1973 when I was in school. What would have been different? Would anything have been different? I maintain absolutely yes, it would have been different. In, in 1973, you had, you had more strengthened families which again doesn't mean that you're not going to have crazy murdering people being born, but it means you're going to at least be be close enough to them to know. The two Columbine shooters that started this whole thing, of all the horror involved in Columbine and all and, and everything it caused, the part of it that just simply beggars del belief is is when the, the parents of both of those mass murdering bastards said. They were building bombs, by the way, stacking ammunition, stacking weapons, walking around in their black trench coats, fascinated with the Matrix. And the parents said, we had no idea that this was coming. We simply had no idea. Well, you should have had an idea. You should have had an idea. If your children are so messed up that they're building pipe bombs and storing ammunition and preparing to go and gun down as many people as they can, I simply refuse to believe that you are not aware that there's a problem with your kids. I don't believe it. I believe you want to get it off your shoulder psychically, but I don't believe it. So w would church have caught this guy? Or, or even more importantly, and this is the, uh, this is the entire theme of Scott Ott's uh, uh, right angle, which I simply forgot to do the thumbnail for, so it's going to be up tomorrow. should have been up today. But Scott Ott's entire point is this, or is, is, the, is so much of the problem really that we think that the solution is to get together and, and pass a law that these students... Are, are calling for uh, gun legislation and they're and they're starting hashtags and you know and, and and they're starting Facebook pages and they're and they're petitioning Washington and they're doing all this they're waiting for somebody out there to pass a law to protect them from this stuff and there is no law that's going to protect you from this there never has been and there never will be your best protection against this is to understand that that lunatic who you've been sitting next to for 15 years or whatever is uh, in fact a serious psychopath and needs to be dealt with. And again, I want to repeat everything I said in this uh, in Scott's show, but look, if you think that having the FBI investigating everybody is going to solve this problem, you're wrong. You don't want to live in a world where the FBI investigates everybody all the time. Trust me on this. So what, what, what would be appropriate? What can you do while preserving your civil liberties and all the rest of it? What, what would have been appropriate? Well, if a guy is making threats that he's going to kill somebody, or if he's just talking in those same general kind of terms, then if it were me, I would say, to my kids, if I had kids, you hear that kind of talk, you come talk to me about it. You hear somebody saying something like that, before you do anything else, come talk to me, tell me what they said. 
And if I listen to a child of mine saying, yeah, uh, Johnny was talking about how he was going to get a gun and shoot up school or he wants to be a professional school shooter or something like that, I would make a pretty rapid decision to get in touch with the principal of that school that day and uh, sit down with the principal and say, well, if you're not going to call the police or the FBI on this guy, I'm going to. Now, this guy got called. Apparently, officials visited his house 39 times, something like that. The FBI dropped the ball on this guy. Listen, this is not any comfort to the people who are, who, are, who are dead out there because of this. But on some level, we have to, we don't have to like it, but we have to ex accept the fact that on some level, mistakes like that happen. That's not, I'm not trying to be flip or, or cold about it. On the contrary, I'm just saying that it's human nature. It's sometimes people just make mistakes. They just slip up. They don't, the, sometimes somebody's, somebody gets a blood transfusion of the wrong type and somebody dies. And that's not good. And it's not like we shouldn't try and stop it. But at some level, you have to accept the fact that sometimes things just go wrong. And so for the FBI to drop the ball, that's one thing. But for, but for 39 calls or 39 visits from either law enforcement or juvenile or something to this guy, and he's still walking around out there. I mean, that's, that's your problem. And we refuse to accept that we, we refuse to accept the complexity of this issue. That's why people want to just throw guns in, 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 in a certain kind of gun. You know, it, it's it just a certain kind of gun. Let's throw the AR-15 away. I, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, this, um, like this kind of coldly rational about something this awful. But honestly, if you are going inside a building and your goal is to kill as many people as possible, I think you'd be far, far more effective with a handgun than you would with a rifle. It's certainly easier to, to, to block a rifle. It's certainly easier to, to, to move out of the way of a guy who's trying to swing a rifle and then rather with a guy who's got a, a, a bunch of handguns. And as David Wellman points out here in the comments section here, accept the fact that evil exists. And now we're down to the brass tacks of it because everybody's screaming about safety and safety, 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 and we got to be safe, we've got to be safe. How do we make ourselves safe from this? Well, you don't, you can't. This is the this is it. This is the rock bottom problem for progressives and for certain people who simply cannot face it. They can't face it. They cannot face the fact that they are not safe and they never will be safe and no one is safe and no one ever will be safe. That safety is a relative uh, condition and that unless you happen to live in a neighborhood which has been governed by Democrats for 150 years, like an American inner city or something, then the typical American life is astonishingly safe, unbelievably safe. 20 years now or whatever it is, 19, 18 years without a single major, uh, single airline fatality on a, on a U.S. carrier. And, you know, I just don't know what to, I just don't know what to tell people. Um, Ohio Coast, he points out, it's cargo called it is. It's magical thinking. We throw, the, we throw the gun into the volcano and the murder god is appeased and then swell. Then we don't have any problems anymore. It just doesn't work like that. And this goes to the heart of what's so wrong with this Western society today as expressed by primarily by progressives is, is the success of everything that we've accomplished has led people to believe that there is simply no excuse for dying other than in your sleep at age 103 surrounded by loving relatives. Anything other than that is a moral outrage and there's got to be some law, some legislation. And so we try to legislate ourselves into everything and we legislate ourselves out of these facts that murders exist. We're going to legislate ourselves out of medical accidents, out of car accidents. We're going to sue everybody and everything. And as long as we keep suing people and lawyering people and adding new laws, then we'll be safe. But it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work like that. The world is not your personal cradle. 
and it owes you nothing. And 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 your safety and the fate and the safety of your family, I hate to break this to you, is your responsibility. We have a shared responsibility as a society, but ultimately your safety is your responsibility. And if you take it down to the absurd, which is what you have to do to make a point to these people, apparently, if you take it down to the absurd, you, you have to basically say to people, and when I say your safety is your responsibility, what I mean by that is when you're driving down the road in your car at 60 miles an hour, and the only thing that's separating you from pretty much instantaneous death is a yellow line that's painted down the side of the road, you're responsible for staying on your side of that yellow line. It's not going to be a force field there to protect you against you not being responsible for your own safety. Furthermore, you also have to have a responsibility to understand that even though you may not go over that yellow line, you can't guarantee that the person who's coming your way isn't going to go over his yellow line. And so your safety requires that you have to be aware of the fact that this could happen at any time and be ready. And this is called defensive driving. And you don't have to do it. Most people don't do it. But the people that do it, as a rule, live longer. Because I do it. And... I've been in one fender bender. I don't know how many people I know have been in major accidents. I'm always aware of where I'm going to take this car. If this car jumps the line or if somebody slams on the brakes or if I get rear-ended. I'm always, always thinking about it. It's just automatic. You can train yourself to do this. This whole situational awareness thing, the idea of where am I going to go? What's going to happen? What am I going to do if, if this car starts to drift over the line? You start thinking about this way and you don't have to think about it every second. It simply becomes habit. You walk into a restaurant and you look around. I don't think anything about it. I don't go into every single restaurant every single time I go out and scan the audience, you know, and looking for, for, for people who, you know. No, but I am aware of what's going on in that restaurant. And I have a, in just in the space of a glance, I can be aware of the fact that that, that situation over there looks a little dicey. There's something about that guy who's standing out by the newspaper stand that just doesn't look quite right to me. I'm not going to call the cops on him, but um, I'm not going to just walk past him blindly either. This is, whose responsibility is this, you know? I mean, honestly, seriously, these are the, I mean, when you, when you get down to it, if we don't understand this fundamental thing, then we need to have retractable steel covers on every single electrical outlet in every single house and office in the entire country because if we don't accept the fact that it's our responsibility to not stick our fingers or tongues or forks into that thing, then, then who's going to protect us from ourselves? And again, now we re again, you get down to the brass tacks and this is the problem in a nutshell. And, the, and it's not a problem of guns, it's not a problem of defense, it's not a problem of anything other than the fact that there are no grown-ups anymore, there are no adults, no one has responsibility. The only people who can make a decision are the government. That's the only decisions that can be made anymore is, is, is law, le legislation. That's the only decision. And I'll give you a great example of it. I have somebody who I've gotten to know recently who I admire very, very much, and his wife... Um, his wife just recently had a, a, a second scare with a, a, a really nasty kind of cancer, and they got some good news lately on the MRI. But he was looking into a, a new form of treatment, and I, this is not an alternative medicine treatment. I'm just simply saying as people look, do whatever you think works well for you. This is an extremely advanced Western medicine cancer-fighting therapy that uses stem cells. And... If she is able to get on the list for treatment, which is this, this amazing medicine is done by American pharmaceutical companies, and if she manages to get on the, on the, on the testing list for this, it looks like they're going to have to go to Mexico to test her for this drug. So why does she have to go to Mexico to be tested for this drug? Well, because the Food and Drug Administration says that it takes 20 years and $100 million, or whatever the number is, in order for a drug to be passed so that you can use it in America. Now, I would simply ask you this. If you have a form of terminal cancer and somebody says to you that we have a, a, a therapy that has a 3% chance of survival and most of the people 
have side effects that include unbearable agony and, and, and turning green and bleeding out of the eyes. But we have a 3% chance of survival above the statistical average in, in placebo and so on. If it were me, I would say I would like to take the chance. Thank you. And as it turns out, this particular therapy has got a 100% success rate in a very, very small, statistically small sample. But in that small sample, the success rate is 100%. And if I was the person or somebody I cared about was a person with that disease, and I found out the living truth, which is that my own government will not allow me to have this drug, even though I'm terminally ill, what the hell does that leave you? Where do you stay? Where, how can you even be part of a country that's built that way? How can, you, how, can you, how can you call yourself proud to be an American when a government decides that even though you're terminally ill and even though you're a full-grown adult and even though you're willing to sign 200 release forms, you cannot have a chance to decide the outcome of your own life and have a chance to save your own life because some bureaucrat somewhere has decided, no, that's just not going to be a decision that you get to make. You get to make a decision about your own life like that or your own future. No, no, we'll make that decision, you see, because we're professional bureaucrats and we live in Washington and, and we want the power of life and death over people. It's why we got into government in the first place. How do you explain that to somebody? That, you know, that yes, this, this drug may save your life. It may not, but it may. And we're not going to let you have the chance to do that. You can just go off there and die. And all of the rest of the people that come down with this condition in the next 20 years, you can all go off and die too until we've decided that this drug is safe. Well, guess what? I don't care if it's safe. I don't care if it's safe. It, I'm already at the point if I've got, if I've got a, 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 a life-threatening cancer, I don't care if the drug is safe. In fact, if they tell me that this drug is extremely dangerous, it doesn't affect my decision in the slightest. If it's a chance there and no chance here, I'm going with the chance. And again, it comes down to the fact that there are no adults anymore. No one's allowed to be responsible for their own lives. Why could you simply not in America today? I understand about lawsuits and all the rest. Why could, why could you simply not sign a contract witnessed by 50 nuns and 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 Democrats as well, if you want, and simply say, I, Bill Whittle, out of my own free volition and choice, hereby um, turn, uh, hereby uh, forfeit any right to legal, uh, so on and so forth. I'm fully appraised of the risk. I fully understand the risk. And by signing this document, I forego any legal remedy whatsoever should this drug cause me harm. Okay, great. But that wouldn't, it doesn't matter. You could sign that. They still won't let you do it because you're not an adult, because you're not allowed to make a decision about your own life. That's the government's job. It's not your job. Same thing as with the schools. You know? You're not responsible for finding out who these mass murderers are. You're certainly not responsible for defending yourself against them. That's the government's job. So instead of arming yourself, or at the very least, instead of going and talking to law enforcement and school authorities when you're sitting next to a psychopath, much better to start a Twitter hashtag and then to write legislation and have a law passed that's not going to have any effect on anything other than to make you feel safer. Once you get to the point where you realize that life doesn't owe you anything, um, life gets so much simpler and happier too, by the way. You know, honestly, I think really when you get right down to it, all all of the discussions about politics, funding, government, non-government, defense, all of it, mass shooting, all of it, it comes down to happiness, right? You want to be happy. You want to go through this life as a happy person. Okay. Okay. Now, if you accept the fact that sometimes bad things happen for no reason, if you accept the fact that you're responsible for your own safety, and if you accept the fact that you can just simply die at any single moment and there's not a damn thing that you can do about it, a brick can fall on your head. Or you can fall on a brick. It doesn't matter. Once you understand this, life is very, 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 very much more fun and enjoyable. I don't know how people go through life with the mindset that they seem to have. Um, I don't. I don't know how they go through it. I'm just going to pick an example that I probably mentioned before. 
But I remember several different cases hearing Woody Allen talking about how he's terrified of death. He's absolutely, absolutely obsessed with it and terrified of it. And I'm not 100% sure of this, but I'd be willing to bet you everything I own and plus everything you own, that, that Woody Allen has no belief in an afterlife or any religious beliefs whatsoever. So here's a man who is every single day deprived of the happiness that is built into any single day because of his terror of something that may or may not happen that day, may not happen for 10 years or 20 or 50. But in Woody Allen's case, it's not going to be 50. And to spend your entire life miserable because something is coming that you can't do anything about except to obsess about is genuine tragedy to me. Genuine, genuine, absolute tragedy. It, you know, a, a, a coward dies a thousand times, a, a, a brave man dies just once. It sounds like such a cliche. And for people who are cowards, and I used to be one, it's almost like meaningless. What does that do? How does that help me? Well, we've talked about this before on this show. There are some people that just simply will not talk about the idea of dying. They bounce off it like it's a hot, like it's a hot. Don't, don't even talk about it. I don't even want to even talk about it. I don't even talk about it. I want to think about it. Well, you ought to think about it. I thought about it. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, there was some period for some reason or another when I was 16 or 17, I was extremely depressed. I was pretty sure I had some kind of cancer. It turns out, of course, I didn't, but I thought I did. And, and you know... I know I've said this many times before, but it's probably a message that bears repeating. When I had that moment in the glider, when I sat in back of a room of 300 people who are watching a movie that I made, when I've done all of these things that mean so much to me, hanging out with Burt Rutan at Oshkosh, uh, you know, all of these things, I look at these things and go, this is a, this is a well-led life, man. This is, this is the best you can possibly do. This is the best deal you're going to get. You have freaking, you have played your hand as well as it gets played. You're raking in all the chips. It doesn't matter if you have to leave the table eventually. You've just done it well and not done yet. I got a lot of things I want to do still. But honestly, um, uh, 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 Gadsden Barb says that uh, Mark Ruby's attempting to educate and he's getting booed and students are putting their fingers in their ears. Yeah. So that's going to be a segue to our next topic, which is not uh, here. I'll get to you in a minute there, Merlin. Let's just talk a little bit about uh, today's college students and putting their fingers in their ears. I become daily more convinced of this. The best thing that we can do for education is to accelerate the destruction of universities and public schools. That's not to say it didn't work. It worked magnificently. The American public school system for 200 years was the envy of the world, and the American university system was the engine of invention all around the world, and we need to accept the fact that those days are over. And we need to accept the fact that the Internet and the destruction of the social fabric and all of the poison pills that come with social media and all of the progressive ideas about, you know, self-esteem movement and so on has created a, a, a generation of monsters. They didn't create themselves, but that's what they are. Smug, self-satisfied people who, like all teenagers, and I was one of them and so were you, has for the first time in, I think, human history, certainly in, 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 in this civilization, these children have never had, haven't had adults stand up to them and say, you're talking absolute nonsense, but that's what you're supposed to do when you're a teenager. You'll grow out of it. They become more militant. They become more vicious. They become more erratic and more dangerous. Um, I saw a video, some of you may have seen a couple, uh, I don't know, I saw it just yesterday or the day before. It's a guy in a gun store, small little gun store someplace, and this giant Antifa Macy's Day balloon creature comes into the thing, and, and during the entire thing, you can't tell if it's a male or a female and and this this antifa jelly bean 
this is the kind of warrior they are. You know, they call themselves warriors. Uh, this warrior, well, I don't think this warrior could, could, I don't think this warrior could, could get over a wall that's waist high. The good news, by the way, about the destruction of the universities is it's the internet that's essentially caused all these social problems, and it's the internet that allows you to become educated better than anyone has ever been able to be educated in history. I ought to know I'm completely self-educated. I'm a college dropout, and I am interested in everything and the information of the entire human race and grows by billions and billions of items every single day is available to me and I use it because I know the right questions to ask. That's what you need to be teaching people now is how to ask the right questions. So just parenthetically, I'll read something about the Battle of Cannae, let's say, or, uh, or Scipio Africanus or something, and, uh, and, and he lands, you know, in this invasion of Carthage, and he lands in a promontory, you know, two miles to the east of uh, Utica. So now I can look up Utica on Google Maps, and I can look and see that promontory. I can go to a satellite view, and I can say, oh, that's where he went ashore. This kind of thing is very cool. So Eric, uh, Eric Blake says, when I say shut it down, does it mean hillside or liberty? No, of course not. If, 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 as a matter of fact, I have to say this just flew into my head. But seriously, both um, Hillsdale and Liberty should be mega corporations now. There should be a hundred Hillsdale campuses around the country because there are people who are still want their children to get educated. You're going to have to just do it on your own now. It can be done, but we'll have to figure that method out. But these kids are monsters. And, um, and in this video I was telling you about this... See, here's the thing about it was at least, at least other revolutionaries, even in the 60s, even the, the 60s, hippies and stuff they at least had the guts to get into like physical confrontations this creature comes into this arms dealership into a gu small gun store it's not an arms dealership it's a little small gun store tiny one and his first question to the gun owner is uh, so do you sell these to kikes and he said what are you talking about w what do you mean i don't even know what that word means <laughs> Are you asking me, do I sell guns to Jews? Is that what you're asking me? Because that's a pretty obnoxious and offensive term to use. Well, uh, yes, of course I do. I sell them to anybody who's interested in defending myself. Oh, it seems unusual for a Nazi. <laughs> so there's just this creatures, you know, this, this, this giant, take, you know, you put, the pil put the Pillsbury Doughboy in a ninja outfit, and you pretty much get the idea. This thing sits in the middle room there. And then is looking around, and the guy's saying, I think you probably can just leave now. <laughs> mumbling, mumbling, mumbling. And as, it, and, and as, this, uh, as this butter creature gets to the edge of the door, um, says, what's this? And the owner of the gun says, that's a Bible. That's free. You feel free to have it if you want. Take one with you. If you want to burn it, that's your business. I don't care. They're free. Feel free. Just help yourself. So... Um, so this creature says, uh, well, can I have all of them? And the gun store guy says, sure, you can have all of them. So then this person goes outside the store and in the parking lot in full view of the camera, starts smashing the Bibles against the ground and throwing them against cars and throwing them against the windows and so on. And then the guy calls the police because now this person's you know defacing the property. And then the police come and this creature comes back in the store and says, well, you said I could have them and I could do anything I want with them. I said, didn't say you could use them to destroy my property and other people's property. person got arrested downtown. They went. Um, I saw this. I, look, I, 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 let's be real clear on this. Okay, I used to be this stupid myself. I saw this, this kid who was probably 17 years old or something and, and you know, con Antifa sympathizer confronting like the, these proud boys or something like this. And, and this kid, and this kid is saying, you know, somebody says to him, well, listen, genius, you have to have something like this or else how are you going to enforce the rules? And the kid said, well, why would you have to enforce the rules? Why would it, uh, any rule that's worth having, you, you wouldn't have to enforce. I can remember being stupid enough to believe that kind of thing, you know. 
that the whole thing's a giant misunderstanding and that the only laws that are worth having are laws that everybody obeys because according to this person, crime is simply a result of poverty and inequality. And so you don't really need any rules, except the rules to get rid of inequality and poverty. And uh, no one's ever going to tell a lie, and no one's ever going to game the system, and no one's ever going to... In the minds of people like this, criminals are people who are stealing bread for their families, you know? That's how they see criminals. They see them as, as like people who are so disadvantaged because of the horrible racism of America and this horrific nightmarish civilization that we live in are forced family men and women all forced to go out and, and maybe you know rob a convenience store so that they can get bread to feed their families take an apple off of the cart you know before the, the pigs come and bust their heads this is what they think because they're children and, and they're not in any um, they're not going to grow up. And that's also the core of the issue, right? A little while ago we were saying the problem with the country is there are no adults in the country anymore. Well, you think about it. If you want government control, if you're a progressive and you want to control other people's lives, when you would want to make sure that no one can control their own life. The only, the only thing that control a, a person's life is the government. And since you're into politics, that means you, which means you get to control that person's life and your own life. You see how it works? Very simple, really, once you get down to basic motivations. And so, and so if you want a society where everybody does what you tell them to do, Ideally, you want a society of children, right? That's what children do. Children do what you tell them to do. Adults think for themselves. And adults can say, I don't I understand that drug is dangerous. Yes, I understand that. Well, it might kill you. Yes, I understand that. Yes. And it might make you very, very sick as well. Got it. I'm already very, very sick. Maybe you ought to be spending your efforts on, oh, I don't know, like keeping poison out of the food supply or maybe, you know, checking for salmonella and chickens, the kind of things that you were originally put in place to do, you know, rather than hold other people's lives in your hands. I'm not asking you, is this drug safe? I'm telling you, I know it's not been proven to be safe, and I'm willing to take this chance. But Contracts don't mean anything anymore. Releases don't mean anything anymore. Liability is, is eternal. You, you know, there's a story from 10 or 15 years ago, maybe even longer, maybe 20 years ago, where some guy, a nut fooling now, got, got, got roaring drunk into a Cessna, flew into a mountain in a rainstorm, upside down, roaring drunk, and they sued Cessna, and they won. There was a person whose son broke into a car lot, stole a car, and as they were joyriding around out of town, the thief got into a fatal auto accident, and the family of the thief sued the car dealer for not having had better security and preventative measures, that the car dealer had not fulfilled his obligation to prevent their son the thief from stealing a car and thereby hurting himself. This is the world we live in now, and that story's 15 years old. So, when it comes to students and universities and all the rest of it, I come to believe that everything we do to try and fight this is not only not going to work, but it's actually hurting. It's, it's delaying the inevitable. It truly is lining up the lawn chair, uh, the uh, the um, the lounge chairs on the Titanic. When, in point of fact, we ought to be strapping together anything that floats and chucking it overboard and swimming for our lives because this ship is going down, and um, and that's what we need to understand. And and even these monsters that even the progressive professors are terrified of now, even them. Even they know it. And uh, 
and it's gone and it's ruined it's gone there's some things that happen and this is one of them it's would be nice if universities were still places to go to hear new opinions and open up your eyes and learn things that you didn't know before. But now they're places for you to go plug your ears and chant, and they can have it. They can have it. I don't owe, I don't owe those idiots anything um, other than to accelerate their contact with reality because reality wins every time, and that's the ace in the hole for the rest of us. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, moving on. 